Gospel of Mark, chapter 5, starting at verse 1. Let's ask the Lord's blessing on this word. Father God, as we open your gospel, that great declaration of the good news of Jesus Messiah, open our eyes and ears to hear what the Spirit is saying to us today. Lord, we understand what you accomplished, Jesus, through this great work, and we know that in it we find something for us even now, and that you would apply it and manifest it in our midst. In Jesus' name, amen. Let me read you what's taking place here in Mark chapter 5 so that we can understand what God wants us to know. If you'll remember, they got across the lake. That's where we left off this great tale. They made it across. And now we start in chapter 5. They came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gerasenes. And when Jesus had stepped out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. He lived among the tombs, and no one could bind him any more, not even with a chain, for he had often been bound with shackles and chains, but he wrenched the chains apart, and he broke the shackles into pieces. No one had the strength to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and on the mountains, he was always crying out and bruising or cutting himself with stones. And when he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and fell down before him. And crying out with a loud voice, he said, What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I adjure you by God, do not torment me. For he was saying to him, Come out of the man, you unclean spirit. And Jesus asked him, What is your name? He replied, My name is Legion, for we are many. And he begged him earnestly not to send them out of the country. Now a great herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside, and they begged him, saying, Send us to the pigs, let us enter them. So he gave them possession. And the unclean spirits came out and entered the pigs, and the herd, numbering about 2,000, rushed down the steep bank into the sea and were drowned into the sea. Well, that's quite a story, isn't it? You got the disciples, you got Jesus, you got his apostles, you got demons, and you got pigs. Makes for a good story. It's an amazing event. But you need to get into the background a little bit about this and realize what it must have been to be a follower of Jesus and in that boat with him, landing on that shore. If you remember, you had a good campaign going. You had a lot of people coming out, healing, deliverance. This is all good in Israel. And uh, as you're in the Galilee and in that area, uh, people are seeing the majesty of Christ displayed. Jesus then says, let's go on the other side. Now, unbeknownst to us, that other side is a terror. That other side is a, is a pagan side of the Sea of Galilee. It's called the Decropolis. And when Jesus said, we're going to the other side, I would imagine that the apostles were a little hesitant. But he knows what he's doing. Let's go. You see, that, uh, that Ger- uh, Gerardines, or uh, it depends on your translation, or the Gerasenes, that area of land was a Gentile pagan community of ten cities called the Decapolis. Deca, meaning ten. Pagan. They worshipped pagan idols. They worshipped uh, uh, foreign gods. And so Jews didn't like unclean things according to God. And so when Jesus said, we're going to the other side, it's like, are you sure about this? I don't think I really want to go there. You know how people feel like when you say you live in Detroit and they want to come visit? Okay, I'm just checking. (laughs) Right? I mean, people think it's crazy here in Detroit. We know it's all right. It's all good. God's under control, right? But people in other cities go, where do you live? And so it's okay. So they're going over. And so as they're going, it's not enough that the sea and a storm comes up and the wind begins to to just thrash them around. Remember, these are experienced fishermen who have been on this boat before. I think part of their fear is we're headed over to this place. Obviously, demons and the devil don't want us there. There's this stuff pulling up and causing calamity. Jesus gets up and says, hey, stop it, calm down. And then they get more afraid of him. Well, 
So they get to the other side, like he said, and it says, as Mark says, immediately, immediately, Mark's favorite word, immediately they get out of the boat, Jesus puts his foot on the shore, and all of a sudden, coming running from the hills, is this naked madman with bruise and cuts and chains rattling, ah, screaming, falling down at Jesus' feet and saying, what do you want with me, Jesus, son of God? How would you like that? I think the apostles probably didn't even get out of the boat. They're like, what a welcome, huh? That's scary stuff. Jesus isn't even rattled. Do you think Jesus knew why he wanted to go to the other side? The thing that amazes me is Jesus went to the other side, I believe, for that one man. For that one man that everybody else gave up on. We can't restrain him. We can't stop him. They kick him out of their society. He lives in the graveyard. He's foreign to them. He's a madman to them. They chain him up. He breaks his chains and shackles. He cuts himself. His hair must have been crazy wild. He didn't comb it. His teeth probably black. Blood dried all over him, dirty and filthy. And he smells like terrible maggots and luck. And he comes up to Jesus, the outcast. You imagine that Jesus set sail and went through a storm and went through all of that for one soul? Would Jesus do that? Yeah, you know what? If we were to look at ourselves and our condition, we thought we were all primped and proper, and, but in the spirit we were just as filthy as any man possessed by thousands of demons. And he comes to the one, and he cares about that one when everyone else cast him out. It's amazing to me, this story. I want to share some insights with you about it. This Decapolis, this area, this region which was unclean and foreign to the Jews, that they didn't want to be there, was a place of pagan worship. And they would offer sacrifice to their gods, and they would worship idols. But Jesus was going over there for a purpose and for a reason. And when he got there, he met this guy. This guy possessed by demons. And as he comes, he falls down and he cries with a loud voice. You ever, you ever try to minister to someone who's drunk or high? Huh? You ever, they're like really loud and in your face. I'll do whatever you want. This guy comes running up screaming, what are you doing here, Jesus? And they say this, he says, What have you to do with me, Jesus, the Son of the Most High God? I adjure you by God, don't torment me. Wow, don't torment me. Now, we haven't seen Jesus in that sense of him being the one who torments demons. But you see, there's something interesting about this, and I've shared it earlier on in this study. The demons knew who Jesus was. They knew his glory. I want you to understand something, that when that storm came and swelled up, when the sea was rocking and, and Jesus calmed it, I'm thinking that as that boat's getting closer to the shore, that madman who's rooting in, in grubs and eating things and just kind of rummaging around in the rocks, all of a sudden senses something. The demons in him rise up. Because the Son of Glory is about to stand on that seashore. I believe that something trembled. It said he came running to him. I believe that as soon as the toe of the Most High God touched the sand when he got there, that region changed in its climate spiritually. The glory of God touched down on that beach and those demons could do nothing else but present themselves to God. And they had to run to him and bow before him. See, they understood who he was, the Son of the Most High. They understood he was Messiah. They understood that when Messiah comes, he will establish his kingdom and his millennial reign and that he will lock up all demons and all satanic work and put them in chains and in bondage for a thousand years. They knew that. And they came and said, not now. Don't torment us now. How many of you see Jesus as the ruler of all, the king of kings, the one who will crush Satan under his feet? We've made him the beach blanket Jesus. We've made him the cool, happy friend guy. Demons tremble when he is present. Oh, for the church to walk in that glory. 
for the church who represents the living Christ, who has that same Jesus in them, that when we would step into a region or a territory, demons would shudder and begin to fall before the majesty of the body of Jesus Christ, his church. I pray for that day. I know it's coming. And I pray and I watch and I look for it. And I want to be prepared. They said, hey, don't torment us. Don't torment us. Now, what's interesting about all of this is we see a few things about demons and about their abilities. Obviously, they have supernatural strength. Demons have the ability. These are embodied spirits. They have the disembodied spirits. They have the ability, obviously, to move things in the physical realm. Uh, we, we, we know that because hey, how many of you remember when the, angel lift up, the angels lifted up the stone in front of the tomb of Jesus? and removed it. So they have the ability to move in the physical and give super strength to this guy. I mean, he was bound with chains and fetters, right? Hands and feet. And, and being compelled by this demonic force, he must have taken rocks and smashed these, these chains and broke and busted them off. No one, it said, could constrain him or restrain him. Isn't that amazing? So I want you to have a sense of the power that the demonic has. He definitely has power. We need to be aware of that. But we, and, and, and not just play games with it. There's a lot of Christians who think if I say uh, Jesus, then I'm good. You know, if you're ignorant of who you are in Christ, the enemy will run all over you. Now, how many of you remember the seven sons of Sceva? Now, now, they were not followers of Jesus, but they thought if they'd use the same incantation that the Christians did in Jesus name get out of this man and the demons said uh, Jesus we know Paul we know who are you and they just jumped all over this guy beat him uh, well the seven sons beat up seven guys they ran away naked all right so we, we we know we have authority over the demonic we know we have power but let's understand their power and let's understand this isn't a game to be played This is serious, but we also need to know that we do have authority in Jesus' name to cast them out and to stand against them. You need to understand that. The devil and demons do not want to come up against a Christian who does understand the authority of the Word of God, all right? And we've used this illustration a lot. It's the difference between Barney Fife and Clint Eastwood. Both are police officers, both have the badge and authority to do so, but they know how to wield their power. Would you agree? Barney's got one bullet. Stop. Right? But Clint, he understood the authority of his power. Make my day, right? You sure you want to do this? This is power. And so a Christian who understands his authority is not shaken by the demonic. Jesus didn't budge him. This guy's running. Ah! Falls down. He's like, stop it. Come out of him. Get it. Cut it out. Stop it. Says that while he's screaming, Jesus said, told him to be quiet. All right? So I'll tell you what the devil does have since the cross. All he has is the power of fear and intimidation. That's how he gets most of us. Fear and intimidation. The power of fear is extreme because it destroys faith. If you find yourself fearful, you will find yourself lacking faith. And so the enemy tries to create fear. And and, and how many of you know that it says in the last days, men's hearts shall fail them? Why? Fear. What do you think terrorism is all about? What are terrorists trying to do? Right now, ISIS is trying to make sure everybody is scared to death for such ferocious and fearful tactics as beheading, right? And that's a spirit of fear. That is a demonic spirit. It is a spirit that is assaulting people's hearts and minds. But believers should not be afraid of them. And so they try to intimidate. They try to blast you. They try to tell you. They try to tell you things. I'm going to do this to you. I'm going to do that to you. And they're going to scare you. They're going to yell at you. They're going to groan at you. They're going to do these different things. But if you understand who you are in Christ, you say, shut up. Stop it. You take your authority. You don't believe that stuff. 
And it's coming a day where you need to learn your authority in Christ so that when you confront a demon, not if, but when you confront the demonic, you will stand your ground. They have strength. They have power. But greater is he that is in you than he that's in the world. Now, secondly, this is a tormenting spirit. This thing wants to just tear this man apart. Come on, you're already possessing him. You're already doing what you want. Why would you go to the extra round of making him cut himself, bruise himself, and annihilate himself? Why don't you just make the guy kill himself? No, 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 they don't want that. They want to torment. They want to have a place to reside, but while they're in him, they just want to batter him and bruise him. Do you need, you know, we need to begin to look at the lost like that. They are being battered and abused by an enemy. They, they don't know what to do. They don't know how to get out of this thing. We've got the answer. And we look at them and say, oh, you're dirty and you're doing bad things. We've got to help them and draw them out of being tormented day and night by an evil enemy. And only Christ is the remedy for that. Now, they know it's Jesus. They know He's coming. But they don't understand that it's Christ's first coming. That was the hidden mystery to these demonics. You see, they thought he was coming to reign in his millennial kingdom, but what they didn't realize is that he was coming to be the sacrifice for sin. They didn't know that part because it was a hidden mystery in God that only God knew the time that when Messiah would come and give himself as a sacrifice. And so they're limited in their knowledge of what Christ was doing. Yet they knew him as the Lord. Now, Jesus says, what is your name? And he says, my name is Legion, for we are many. Legion is a military term. And in Rome, Roman armies, uh, a legion was a number of people from 3,000 to 6,000. So this man had 3,000, some 3,000 to 6,000 demons in him. That's a bit much, wouldn't you say? I think one could wreak enough havoc. Three to 6,000 demons in one man. You'd say, well, how could they all fit in there? <laughs> Remember, the demonic are spirits. They are not bodies. It's not like Ghostbusters where they look like this or they're green plasma or they're this or that. Uh, uh, another way you could understand demonics, uh, demoniacs is, is as simple as a thought. Do you have or could you possibly have Maybe a thousand thoughts contrary to the law or the Lord. Right? Do you have uh, maybe some strongholds in the flesh? Do you have uh, patterns and ideologies that that keep you oppressed and, and ideas, concepts that quite possibly constraining you from the love of God, from, from reaching out and giving your full life to Him? Uh, Absolutely, when you put it in that sense, you can see how so many could occupy. I am not saying that every one of your stray thoughts or that all of your flesh issues are demonic. I'm not saying that, but I'm using it as an example that it can be that simple. That this man was so messed up with so many demonics that he couldn't even think right. That's amazing. They had to find a human being to dwell in for a home because they're disembodied. They're roaming to and fro, as the Bible says, in arid places. And they're looking for a body to inhabit. And so the host demon spoke out and said, We are legion, for we are many. Now, what's interesting about this as well is they are territorial. Because they said, Please do not cast us out of this region. What's the big deal? You know, I mean, it's like, okay, you're in this town. I want you to leave now. Go over to St. Clair Shores. No, no we want to stay in Roseville. Why? Because, again, demons are territorial. They have an assignment. They had done such a work in that community, in the Decropolis, had accomplished so much, and had found a host and a home and an effective thing. They didn't want to lose all their work. They had accomplished so much. They don't want to be broken up and sent away. They're asking Jesus permission. Can we stay in this vicinity? You're kidding me? Hey, listen, I I hope that I'm causing some of you to get stirred. There are demons everywhere in every province, every city, every state. They're round about us. 
This is military talk. They're legions. They are broken up under principalities, thrones, authorities, dominions. They have regional directors, if you will, regional jobs and works that they do in each city. Roseville has a unique blend of demonics. St. Clair Shores has its nautical demonics, I don't know. And then Detroit and Warren, they all have their region and purpose for what they're doing and why they're doing it. They should be trembling because you are going back home today into that vicinity and you are going to change the atmosphere. How many of you remember when the 70 went out into the cities and the demons were cast out and people were healed and Jesus said, I saw Satan fall like lightning. Right? The demonics of that region were turned upside down because the church was loosed into that realm. And so they said, don't send us away. Don't send us away. We want to stay here. And so this was the demon's idea. They say, hey, we beseech God. Please don't do it. Like, what are you talking about? <laughs> you're begging, you're going to beseech God for your behalf? You're a demon. Right? That's what they said. We beseech God. Please don't send us out of this region. Well, then they, they give Jesus an idea. They said, send us into those pigs. There happens to be herdsmen with pigs right over in that area, 2,000 to be, uh, as a matter of fact, 2,000 pigs right over in this situation. And I'm surprised they didn't say, send us over into those herdsmen. But they know Jesus does not want them inhabiting people. He came here to deliver this man, and he does. And so they say, hey, put us in those pigs. Now we know Jews uh, regard pigs as unclean animals. So these unclean spirits would feel right at home being in unclean animals, Right? And so that's an interesting thing that Jesus says, okay, I'm going to do that. Now, think about this for a minute. What's going on here? Uh, Why would Jesus do that? Why would Jesus agree with demons? You know? Unless it was all part of his plan. That he would have them go into those demons. Now, Uh, I read some blogs this morning, it was pretty interesting on this topic, where people were pretty upset with Jesus because he obviously had no regard for these animals. They were very upset that 2,000 pigs ended up dying over this man being delivered. And I think that's rough. Well, I want to tell you something, that the Lord cares about people. He cares about animals too. But those unclean animals had a purpose to accomplish for God. But people don't see it that way. They don't understand the plan of God for those animals. Can I tell you where those 2,000 pigs were headed? They were headed to the temples as sacrificial animals for the idols and gods of Rome. If you'll remember when Rome came into Jerusalem and overthrew it in 70 AD and earlier than that as well, there was the abomination of desolation and what was offered on the altar of God. The pigs, a pig. Romans offered pigs to their deities and to their gods. The pigs were the animals of sacrifice. The pigs were sacred to offer to those gods. What Jesus did was cast those demons into those pigs for the sake of those demonic idols to tell everybody in that land, your sacrifices are unclean and filthy and full of demons. So he attacked the gods of that land and he destroyed the sacrifices that were going to be offered to him. Now it says that as soon as the demons got into those pigs, the pigs freaked out. I know pigs like dirt, pigs like mud, pigs like slop. They don't like demons. There's something filthier than the earth, filthier than the ground, filthier than slop, and filthier than pigs. It's demons. Those demons, now you got... Three to 6,000 demons going into 2,000 pigs. The math doesn't work out. But look, at if you got three to six and one guy, they could find room in 2,000 pigs. And so they go in these pigs. These pigs oink, oink, and snort and snort, and they don't like it, and they start heading for the cliff, and they all run off the cliff and fall into the water and drown. How about that? That's powerful. Again, please come back to the boat and look at John and Peter Thomas. I mean, come on, this is crazy. 
This is crazy. We like a mild, more sensitive Jesus. Jesus comes on the shore. This demoniac comes to him screaming, yelling this and that. He says, shut up. Stop it. What's your name? Yeah, go. Get out of here. They go, Wah! And then all the pigs are, oing, 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 and they go over the cliff. They're all dying. And all this commotion, smoke's rising up. This guy's, and then we, and then we, what's going on? Jesus messes things up. We like him tame. We like him decent and stop that. Right? When Jesus wants to do something, he'll just mess things up. We get all upset about, well, did you see them? They lifted both hands today. Oh, they said hallelujah really loud. This is scaring me. Did you see that? Someone fell down under the power of God. This is too crazy. Yeah? Well, 2,000 pigs hopping off a cliff is goofy too. I mean, come on. Jesus is changing and speaking into a culture and a society that it should stir things up. Imagine the herdsmen. Look at this. Look at the next portion of Scripture. The herdsmen fled. And they told it to the city and to the country. They're getting out of here. I wish I could have seen this activity. Let's recap it one more time because it's so cool. Jesus steps out of the boat, the demoniac running, screaming at him, oh, falls down, he heals him, speaks to him, S- three to 6,000 demons fly over into the air, into a herd of pigs, they start squalling, wandering, running, and all the smoke's over, they're churning off, go off a cliff, the herdsmen are screaming and yelping, and run down the road away. And Jesus turns to his disciples and says, Clothe this man and care for him. Tend to him. Would God cause that kind of a commotion for you? Yeah, he will. He'll come across the sea. He'll come across an ocean. He'll come across a sea of of grime and filth and sin. He'll take your chains off. He'll take your your filth off of you. He'll cover you with his own clothing. He'll stroke your hair. He'll soothe you. And he will speak to you. And for the first time in your life, you will hear with clarity, my God and my Savior. That's awesome. That's awesome. Man. Now look at the genius of this. You know, it's interesting. I, 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 as I was researching some of this in March of 2013 in Shanghai, uh, for some reason, they don't even know why, they found 2,000 pigs in the water. I had to read that report. I'm going, this sounds just like this. Actually, it was 2,800 pigs. They found 2,800 pigs in their water supply just floating in the waters, carcasses and everything. We don't think of the aftermath of this thing. you got 2,000 pigs in your water supply. You've got dead pigs floating in your water next to your cities. This is a mess. This is a problem. Now we've got to go and clean up all these pigs and take them out of the water and do all this, this is messing things up. They don't know why the pigs were in the water at Shanghai. You can see pictures of them pulling out pig after pig after pig, 2,800 pigs, the smell, the stench, it ruined the water supply, it turned the city upside down, people didn't know what was going on. Imagine here that the city is freaking out, they don't understand, what are we going to do? We've got all these rotting pigs now in the water, pull them out, we've got to get rid of them. And these guys are saying that this guy named Jesus healed the guy that was nuts and crazy, but the pigs ran in the water. What's going on here? The herdsmen are out 2,000 sheep. What are we going to do? Now, it says that they went into the country, and the people came to see what it was that had happened. And they came to Jesus and saw the demon-possessed man, the one who had the legion, sitting there clothed and in his right mind and they were afraid why would they be afraid they're no longer afraid of the demon possessed man who are they afraid of now Jesus everybody's afraid of Jesus and so it should be we don't preach a Jesus like this anymore we preach a more kinder and gentler Jesus who is tolerant of everything under the sun Do we remember why Jesus cares for us? Because he paid the price for all sin, not because he's ignoring it. Do you remember his disciples were afraid of him after they saw his power? Now the whole town 
of the Decapolis, all the people from all the countryside come to him. They saw the power of demons on one man's life. Now they see the power of God over demons, and they're afraid of him because he has greater authority than the spirits and the witchcraft and all the boogeyman that they were always afraid of. There is one greater that has come. That's Jesus. And look what they say to him. They're afraid of him, verse 16. And those who had seen it described to them what had happened to the demon-possessed man and to the pigs. And they began to beg Jesus, right? Didn't the demons beg him? Now the townspeople are begging Jesus, and they beg Jesus to leave. Wow. Now I could see Peter and John saying, oh, he blew it again. Missed another opportunity. What is Jesus doing? Why did he do that? Why did he let the demons tell him what they should do? Why did he convince, why did he let the demons convince him that that was the right thing? You saw what happened. It's a mess. The water's polluted. There's dead pigs everywhere. This is, now they won't let us come here. That's fine. Let's get out of here. Was Jesus knowing what he was doing? They began to beg Jesus to depart from the region. And he was getting into the boat. Jesus didn't say anything. Jesus didn't say, come on, guys, I'll lighten up a little, okay? No more pigs, please. Let me stay. I got some good news for you. No, he's, I'm fine. Could it be? Jesus had planned this from the very moment when he said to his disciples, we're going to the other side. Did he know it was a short visit? Did he know who he was going to heal, who he was going to deliver, and then leave? Isn't that an interesting ratio? Jesus would go out of his way for one to be rejected by thousands? Would he do that? See, we keep thinking that, well, I tried to minister the gospel and I only got one person saved, but everybody else rejected me. That's just about normal. Yeah, but there were 3,000 saved on the day of Pentecost. Yeah, 3,000 out of 100,000 people there. It was Pentecost. They're at the feast in Jerusalem. 3,000's a drop in the bucket. What about Paul, Mars Hill? He preaches. He's preaching to all these philosophers, all these Stoics, all these people he's preaching to, and only a few received him. Stop looking at the numbers. Look at your assignment. There was one man Jesus came to rescue, and he did that, accomplished that, and had a purpose. Je Jesus is genius. It's amazing what happens. They asked him to leave. It says, as he was getting into the boat, the man who had possessed, was possessed with demons, begged him. Everybody's begging. Begged him, please let me go with you. I don't have a house. I don't have a home. I've got nothing. I've lost everything. I live in a cemetery. Let me live with you. Let me follow you. Let me be your disciple. I don't want to be with these people the way they treated me. I want to follow you. Please let me go. And everybody else is saying, let them go. You go. Everybody out. And Jesus says this. He did not permit him to go, but said, go home to your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. And he went away and began to proclaim in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him, and everyone marveled. Now Jesus said, go and tell you, tell them what the Lord, Yahweh, Jehovah, had done for you. This man goes and says what Jesus had done for them, the Son of God. He got the message. He heard the demons talking out of him. He understood this is the Messiah, the Son of the living God. This is God in the flesh. And, and it's interesting that what was the trait, what was common to Jesus in Israel among the Jews, if someone got healed, he said, don't tell anyone. If he delivered someone from a demon, don't tell anyone. Everybody he's, that he was healing and ministering to, he said, do not tell a soul about this. Why? Because he needed his ministry to build momentum so he could stay in the region. But he was leaving that region, so he told that man, I want you to go into the Decapolis, tell them what happened, and he did. Now, can you imagine this guy going there? They're not going to believe him. He's all cleaned up. He's got a haircut, brushed his teeth. He probably took the chains off, I'm sure. They wouldn't know who it was. He probably had his t-shirt made with his old picture. I'm the guy. <laughs> that was me. 
that's not you. You're not the guy. I was the guy. No, it's not. Oh, it's the guy. (laughs) What happened? Jesus came to me. Jesus came to save my soul. He visited me while I was in prison, in shackles, demonically possessed. He set me free. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Unashamed, declaring the goodness of God. Would Jesus really do that? Would Jesus save one and ignore thousands? Turn with me to Mark chapter 7. Verse 31. Jesus comes back over the lake, does a number of ministry things, and then it says in Mark seven thirty-one. Then he returned from the region of Tyre and went through Sidon to the Sea of Galilee and the region of the Decapolis. And they brought to him a man who was deaf. And it goes on, who they brought and who they brought. Chapter 8 goes on to say, in the Decapolis he fed 4,000 people through miracles. What happened? What happened? The door opened for Jesus and Jesus knew exactly what to do by healing and delivering the one man the one kingpin, the first fruit of the harvest, by delivering that man and utterly crushing and destroying the spiritual stronghold of idolatry and those pigs and sacrificial offerings with the demons into the lake, the one man had the freedom to preach the gospel and to seed that harvest so that when Jesus again touched his foot on that shore, they came to him. And they begged again, this time, Jesus, heal me. Jesus, touch me. Jesus, feed me. There's a timing in all of this, in God's purposes and in God's plan. Some of you have been frustrated. You've only had one answer to prayer. You've only had God visit you this one time. But He is beginning a harvest through that one work. He's doing a great work. Don't doubt Him. There's something going on that you can't see and you don't understand. But when he visits again, they'll be ready. And they'll be hungry for the Lord Jesus Christ. The next time he came, they wanted him. That is awesome. Jesus has authority over demons. He has authority and power over the demonic. Won't you understand that? And won't you let him minister in your life for that? Let's bow.